Hello, and welcome to the Writing Momentum Podcast. I'm Christopher Maselli, and this is my wife, Gina. How's it going, Gina? I'm doing great today, Chris. It's We are enjoying cooler weather, which sounds crazy because um, it's summertime, but where we live, we are headed toward fall already. Yeah, so we're in northern that. Arizona, so we get what is called the monsoon season, where it will storm, rain, and <laughs> storm every day. For about yeah. six weeks, six yeah. to eight weeks, it just storms. But then that's about all the rain we really get for the rest of the year. And so, um, but, but those bring in a lot of cooler temperatures. So we are loving it. Sure do. So beautiful. Well, today we are talking about how, you know, you know when you're writing, there are times you want to have influence on others, right? Mm -hmm. We're hoping that what we write can change lives. Yeah. And we're hoping that we can write things that challenges others, challenge what they uh, their preconceived notions, challenges maybe their beliefs sometimes, uh, it challenges their way to think things mm -hmm. differently than they've thought before. Uh, and when you do that, you can't just, usually it doesn't come naturally to most of us, right? We have to actually think, how am I going to write this in such a way that someone who doesn't normally think about this the way I'm suggesting, mm -hmm. but they might cause them to think a little differently, right? Exactly. And so uh, that is what we're going to talk about today is, is how can we do that? And when it comes down to it, there are three components that each writer must consider when writing an article or a book and they want to persuade. Mm -hmm. There's these three components. And these aren't these like classical components? These are. This is classical. This goes all the way back to Aristotle. He's the first one that very uh, wrote about that. In fact, he has a very short book. You can find it on the internet called Rhetoric. And when we hear the word rhetoric in our day and time, a lot of times we think of it somebody who's kind of beating their fist against uh, something. They're, they've got kind of a soapbox that they've climbed up on and they're just spouting their beliefs. But the, the classical term of rhetoric, like Chris said, goes all the way back uh, to Aristotle, goes back to the Greeks. And it is the idea of persuading people, persuading people that your point of view and what you have to say is valid and that they would want to, to, to take what you're saying to heart, that, that it would in some way uh, change the way they think or change somehow they do things. Um, and so it'd be something that they can apply to their life. And we see this in a lot of nonfiction writing today. We see it in blogs where, we're, where it's like four points to this or five points to do that or five ways to do this. It's in nonfiction with self-help books, how to overcome this, how to overcome anxiety, how to overcome depression, how to overcome uh, a lack of sales in your business, how to overcome you know, you're, you're helping people, you're helping teach them a system or a way of thinking about something. So we see this a lot and we don't really think about it all the time. We don't really stop to think about what we're doing, but we are trying to convince people that we, what we are saying has merit. So often when I hear the word persuade, I think that this is like a, you might write this if you're writing a strong, theological piece or mm -hmm. a strong political piece, right? You're trying to persuade people to come to the other side, mm -hmm. but that's not really always the case because so, some of the things you just mentioned are very small <laughs> persuasions, right? Four ways to do something better is that that's not even much of a persuasion, but I guess it is. You're trying to get people to think about things differently. Think about things differently. Some way to apply what, what you're teaching them so that they can make their life better. Or it, in some way. It just floors me that some of these things have been around so long. I tend mm -hmm. to think of writing like this as a modern concept, right? Writing persuasion. And to hear that it comes from Aristotle, you know, Aristotle is the guy who also uh, wrote all about the three-act structure in fiction, right? Yeah. And we tend to forget about that. We think this is a modern invention, and it's not. It it's goes not. way, way it's back. It's all the way back. So we're going to break this down today. There are three different areas and three different elements that you want to include if you are trying to persuade people that what you have to say is valid. Yeah. And and I will say I do try in almost everything that I write, I will try to bring this in. I will try to bring each of these elements in. Now sometimes you might be writing something so small that it that it's just not you don't have room for all three of them. But especially if you're doing a book, I would really strongly encourage you to really 
think about these elements and how you can bring them in. Because here's the other thing that we want to point out, and we're going to get into what those elements are. But people think and process differently. Yeah. And so when you are speaking to different types of people, you may have to persuade them or, or meet them in a different way. So with one person who's very logic based, you might need to meet them with facts and figures. Mm -hmm. With someone who is more emotive, someone who is more empathetic, you may have to meet them on more of an emotional level. Yeah. So convincing people that your position has va validity, it takes coming at these uh, different ways. And so again, you know, we say this in, in nonfiction. I try to teach people that when you're thinking about nonfiction, it's not always just about what you have to say. It's what your reader needs to hear. Mm, and good. it is what your reader needs to hear. And so how you speak to them is going to change how what that how they perceive what you have said and whether they can take it in okay so now you said there's three ways to speak to them that we're going to cover here so yes. what are those okay. three ways let's, give take, you them, some let's take them one at a time okay here. one at a okay, time get ready for the first one it's pathos 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 is an appeal to emotion hmm. appeal to emotion so this is stories metaphors, strong verbs, vivid descriptions. That's what you're going to use in order to evoke emotion in your reader. So, uh, you know, and I've heard people question, do you really want to, are stories really important? It feels like fluff, but there are people, there are readers that are going to gravitate or they're going to latch on to your stories before they latch on to your lessons. So in a nonfiction book, you might start off a chapter not getting into all the points you're trying to make, but rather by telling a story that grabs people's emotions and mm -hmm. makes them identify with what you're talking about. Exactly. And that is that's going to appeal to the motion to where they will then open up and listen to what you have to say. Yes, it really helps bring those barriers down and helps them open their heart to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So yes, and here's the, uh, one thing that's important is that doesn't always have to be your personal story. It can be your personal story. If you've had some kind of transformation, maybe you've become a really good salesperson or maybe a really good marketer, or you've become someone who's you know developed in your self-confidence, it can be your personal story, but it can also be stories of famous people that people would identify with. It can be stories of other people who have um, put you, what you're saying into practice. Mm -hmm. It can also be people who have who have dealt with the same challenges that you've dealt and with. Probably the thicker the book is, the more you need to have more stories because it can't be all about you. So you're going to bring in a lot of different people. That also kind of proves it, right? That's that that social validity to what you're talking about, to, mm -hmm. to see that so many other people put these principles into practice and they worked, that makes it seem like, oh, okay, I yeah. think that this may have validity. Yes. So our next one is ethos. ethos. Ethos is an appeal to credibility. This is where you as a writer are going to share your background, your experiences, your credentials. This is where you're going to be able to say, well, when I was... Yeah, so it, this. this might usually show up near the beginning of a book mm -hmm. because you want to establish your credentials right away. Like, why should you talk about this? Right. Now, in an article, maybe not so much. Maybe right. you'd wait until the point comes along that you want to tie your credentials to. But either if way. You can even do that. Yeah. You know, as a, as a writer of an article, you may not need to be in that article at all. True. But where you need to bring in the credibility of your sources. Uh, so if okay. you're bringing in your sources, you might want to say, you know, the editor of this magazine says this or this um, something else, you know, this person. And maybe even as you share their story, you're also giving their cred their credibility of why what they have to say is important. So it's not necessarily personal credibility. Mm -hmm. It's just credibility for the piece. Depending on what you're talking about, who you're talking about, there may be things that, that you have to support it and you're bringing in those things. It could even be the credibility of a company, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have to be a person. 
Yes, I would say that as well. Okay. Whoever you're writing for, that market, that reader needs to believe that that you have a right to speak into their lives. Ethos, ethos, and then what's the third The one? last one is logos, and this is an appeal to logic. Hmm. So this is where those facts and figures, those quotes, there's reasoning, statistics, studies, all of things like that, and even defining what you mean. This is something that is, again, a very classical thing, but defining your terms. Yeah. If you are writing a, a book or a, an article about blended families, you want to define what you mean by blended family. Mm -hmm. If you are talking about um, something with extended family, you want to define what does that mean by extended family? Are you talking about people who live in your home with you? Or are you talking about just family members who are in your family? your family, your bloodline, but they don't necessarily live with you. You want to define those terms. Because you can't just assume that the reader is coming at this from the same same standpoint, yes. with the same experience that you have. Exactly. Because they may, you know, when you say um, like extended family, that may mean something completely different to someone who grew up somewhere else, lived in different conditions and what it means to you. Exactly. Exactly. Even, even things like financial responsibility you know you t you use that term like financial responsibility what does that mean i don't know what that means <laughs> <laughs> that could mean something completely different to different people so for your audience for your reader you want to define what you mean but also going back to the quotes the figures the studies the um statistics those kind of things feel free to bring those things in you know depending on your audience um, you are going to have people who are going to gravitate to those. They're going to love those charts. They're going to love the, um, the, the logical elements that you bring to your piece. They're going to really gravitate to those. And it's going to give, the, give your work some, it's going to ground your work really mm -hmm. and make people be able to say, okay, I can trust this person because I know that they know what they're talking about because they're bringing this in. And you can see how when you bring all three of these together, when you bring the pathos, the ethos, and the logos together, when you're bringing in that appeal to emotion where people say, okay, I, that person understands my situation. And then you bring in the ethos and you say, oh, that person is very credible or the sources that they're, um, they're, citing are credible. And you do want to make sure if you're writing for something that you are citing credible sources um, from organizations that are in that field mm -hmm. or uh, government organizations that have studies on things like that or academic um, areas. You want to make sure that your sources are, are credible as well. Well, but you bring that in and then you bring in that appeal to that logos, that appeal to logic with some statistics and studies and that kind of thing all of a sudden you've got this very well-rounded piece mm. that really does make someone believe, gosh, I'm going to stand up and take notice of what this person is saying. Right. It's persuasive, right? It's, it's persuasive. Convincing. It's convincing. You, you know what's interesting about this is as you're going through these, you know, we're talking about articles and books, but really each one of these is also usually an element of an advertisement, right? Mm -hmm. If you do any kind of advertising writing, if you're doing something longer like a letter, of course, you could include all three, right? Anytime you, mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who write for nonprofits and you write donor letters or that sort of thing, you might appeal to each one of these. But for those who are even just writing a small advertisement, maybe a one paragraph advertisement about a book or about something else, you want to see if you can include at least one of these in that advertisement mm -hmm. because that's what helps make the sale, right? So when, when you watch a commercial next time, ask yourself, is this commercial, is it appealing to my emotion, credibility, or logic? Is it mm -hmm. pathos, ethos, or logos? And every commercial pretty much has one of those in it, doesn't they it? They have one of those. Think about your car commercials. You know, it starts off with this family trying well, to... It could be any of these. The, the car commercial might be an emotion one, right? It might just have music and you see people having a good time and you're like, oh, I want to have a good time like that. It's appealing mm -hmm. to my emotion. In a beautiful setting, right? In a beautiful it's setting. Got this, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be one of those car commercials where they talk about how long the company's been around and how great they make those vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. That's the appeal to credibility, the ethos. Mm -hmm. Or it could be the fact that, you know what? 
our cars have a uh, uh, fewer crashes than other cars, mm -hmm. right? That's getting into in a, in a test by such and such. Nine out of ten people word. purchase our vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, any of those things are yes. lovers. It would even say uh, the money side of it. Mm -hmm. Buy by the end of this month and save three thousand dollars off of the sticker price. Okay. That is an appeal to logic. You're going, yeah, sign the check, <laughs> right? So that is. That's what we're talking about today. We hope that, you know, take some time to, like Chris said, watch those commercials if you still watch commercials. <laughs> watch commercials, flip through magazines, look at billboards, look at, if you're in a doctor's office, flip through the magazines that are sitting there and look for these elements, the appeal to emotion, the appeal to credibility, and the appeal to logic. Yeah. Look at those three elements and see where you see them. And then look at how you can bring those. If you're a nonfiction writer, look at how you can bring those into your writing. Yeah. And so your assignment this week is to look at the latest blog you've written or look at the latest mm -hmm. article you've written or look at that book you're writing and ask yourself, are you including pathos? ethos and logos yeah. into that piece all right well thank you for joining us uh, we always enjoy when you get together with us we ask that you uh, uh, please just take a moment to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any future podcasts share it with someone who's not heard it before and um, uh, let's get the word out there uh, well, and I'll, I'll just add this too. If you're a writer and you're looking to join a writing community, please join us at Writing Moments. Yep. Writingmoments.com. We'd love to have you there. It's a beautiful community that's coming together where we are supporting one another. We spend a little bit of time uh, learning and doing trainings, but training then just like what, just like what we talked about here. Mm -hmm. But then we also... Um, really support one another and we're learning about each other's projects and just and we spend time writing together we work on our individual and then we write together, together. Yeah. and so we are really seeing some momentum on our projects so that's at writingmoments.com so please join us we appreciate you guys you're the best and until next time remember that together we have writing momentum